Gentleman Foundation, Dr. Jorg Drager. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here. And there's one amazing thing. We had many sessions this morning, and they weren't about education. But people mentioned education, mentioned the changes in which we learn. And I'm trying to talk a little bit about the transformation we will see in the digital age due to education here. So let's start with something you're pretty used to. I mean, we all know we don't buy a CD, but you know, we have our little playlist on the smartphone, and you know, we, we don't go to some shopping malls anymore, but we just order it all on the internet. And there's one field that has been pretty untouched by any change during the last couple of thousand years. You know, when Aristoteles sat under the olive tree, there were 30 people sitting around him, and if a teacher in a classroom today is sitting there, there are also 30 students around him. And the point I'm trying to make is that this will change. And some people think it's now technology that will change education, or maybe the Generation Y moving into the education system, or maybe it's venture capital that is suddenly available for education. I'm going to argue a little differently. There are four huge unsolved challenges within the education system that will make the change necessary, and then digital technology is just the enabler that will make it happen. So let's look at those challenges. Challenge number one, there are, I don't know whether too many, but at least a huge number and increasing number of young people wanting to be educated. During the last 10 or 15 years, we've seen an increase of 50% of the students, and for the next 10 or 12 years, the prediction is we will see another doubling of the number of students worldwide. And all of them want to be educated. We're in Germany. In Germany, the number of people going to university has increased over the last 40 years from 6% to almost 60%, factor of 10. The US talks about college for all. In countries like Korea, 80% of the young people get university degrees. And when the Indian Premier Minister is talking about skilling up his country, he says 500 million people will have to be skilled within the next decade. Too many. The second issue that comes along with too many is too diverse and too different. And every teacher will tell you, I would do a better job if I didn't have this problem that my students are too different in the classroom. If they were all the same, I could do a much better job in teaching. And this is what's going to happen. You ask kids at age five, when they enter school, do you like what you do there? Do you love school? And 95% of the kids say, school is great, I love to go there. And you keep asking that question year after year, and when the kids are about 15, you lost two-thirds of them. One-third is so bored because it's so easy, they don't follow. And the other third is so overstrained that they can't follow. And there's one-third in the middle to which you centered your teaching just in the right way that they stick with you. Too many, too diverse. The third issue, the outcomes are pretty poor. It's a flat line. The Americans have measured pretty much everything in their education system. So this is from 1970 to 2008, the reading skills of US students at age 15 or something like that. And you can do that for mathematics, and you can do that for physics. Our jobs get more challenging and more challenging every decade. But our kids remain on a flat curve. And that wouldn't be so bad if there wasn't challenge number four. Because at the same time where the outcome is flat, the inflation-adjusted cost 
per pupil has gone up by almost 240%. So we've got a system in which we want to educate more and more people, and we don't do well in dealing with growing heterogeneity. And the outcome is flat, and the cost is exploding. This is why we need digital technologies. And it won't be the old concepts that will fix our system. Because, you know, what we still do, you know, it more or less still looks the same. And there's one teacher and 30 students in 45-minute units sitting in a classroom, broadcast learning, you know, I'm sending, I'm sending like I do now. And in the end, all of you have to take the same test individually. This is not going to fix our system. This is not going to solve our challenges. So let's look at, in a little more systematic way, the four key benefits that digital technology and the digital world will bring into education. And the first benefit, most of you who read newspapers and the word MOOC has been mentioned several times today, most of you are pretty familiar with it. It's making education more accessible. It's democratizing education. You have this one great guy in the middle. He or she is a perfect teacher, and you just take his teaching, and you send it everywhere in the world. And it's democratizing education because, I mean, take Sebastian Trun's first MOOC, Artificial Intelligence, out of Stanford. I think 160,000 people were taking it. He forced his own very carefully picked Stanford students to take the course as well. And 410 people in the course who were not at Stanford scored better than the very best Stanford student. And so the carefully selected elite is getting under pressure because of a democratizing of education and making it more accessible. And when Sam Khan, the investment banker in New York City, was trying to explain to his cousin mathematics, and the cousin happened to be in New Orleans, I don't think that he thought that a couple of years later, 400 million downloads of his videos would be in use for people trying to understand mathematics or history. And that Sam Khan became the first rock star of the learning net. Making it more accessible is a good catalyst. It's not the game changer. The game changer is more when you go into making things more personal. What digital technology can do is it cannot only massify, it can offer you an individualized product at the time where it still massifies. It's like the little playlist on your smartphone for your music. It's assembled by you. And what digital technology and algorithms will do is what you see here on the picture. Learning will be break, broken up into small modules. And it will be an algorithm that is guiding every single one of those learners through an individual learning path. And any good tutor can do that at Oxford or Cambridge, supervising two students. But this technology is doing it while one million students are watching. You have the little smartphone camera checking whether you still follow me, and it's interrupting the video you are watching when your mind is drifting off. And you have the little algorithm leading you from step to step, and you have schools teaching after that principle. You know, almost 100 students in a classroom, algorithms computing overnight, <coughs> the program for the next day, and those schools do significantly better than when you force 30 students with one teacher in a classroom. And the benefit number three is making learning more social. I mean, it's always been social. And most of you probably learned more from your peers than you learned from your professor in the classroom. But what I mean by making it more social is 
making it in an organized way more social. Use digital technology to facilitate learning in groups. And what is so helpful is that a new generation of learners is entering the university. It's the generation Y that likes to share. They're not only networked and connected, they really like to share knowledge. WeQ is more important for them than IQ. And if they're willing to share, and if they have technology to do so, they are better and smarter in learning from each other than from their professor. And you look today in the classroom, 500 people. We saw this wonderful picture with the Pope with all the smartphones up. You look into a classroom, 500 people watching the professor, 400 have their smartphones in their hand, and you think they're Googling or Facebooking around, they're chatting to each other. Hey, did you understand that? I think I have a better explanation for that. Why don't we look at this link? This is much better than what this guy is explaining us there in front. And it's this making it more social in an organized way. Why are peer-to-peer -peer universities or tandem learning for languages that will revolutionize education? Because if you don't have teachers, you can do without them. And if you have, if you have them, the hierarchy breaks down, they're more a coach on equal level rather than the one guy who knows it all. And the last benefit I want to come to is making it more valuable. Because you have those machines, you type in your profile, they analyze you, and you say, I want to work at Vodafone, and they say your hiring chances are 28% at the moment. But take those two courses and your hiring chances go up to 59%. And there are algorithms guiding you through your learning path. Those are the four key benefits digital technology will bring to us. The problem is a little that Europe is not really leading the game. We are lacking behind. And in order to be ahead of the game, and in order also to make sure that we don't become a digital colony of the US for learning, they have those wonderful products, but I believe we should have something of our own. We got to do at least two things. The first thing is we in Europe need more than just rigid data protection. Because everything I described to you, all the algorithms, they need data. And what's happening, you pay with your data. I mean, it's like this car insurance that says, I give you this 20% discount if I get access to your GPS data because then I know when you're speeding. I mean, here you're selling your learning data. The employer can watch you taking the digital exam without you knowing it, but then he's paying for your exam, then it's free. And we need a way in Europe to deal with digital sovereignty. And the second issue we need to deal with is something we already have. It's a framework called Bologna. We created it in Europe so that in this enormous region of almost 500 million people, students can move around freely. And the idea was to bring the students to the education. We just have to turn it around. Now the education wants to come to the student. And we have this system of mutual recognition of credit points, and we got to use it in a sensible way in order to open up that space that I can use my MOOC from Cambridge or my product from elsewhere and get it recognized at my home university. And if Europe is doing those two things, a fair way of dealing with data and using this Bologna digital in order to make education move around in Europe, and if we invest Europe-wide in content, then we have a chance against the strong American brands. I have one minute left, and I want you to take at least one thing away from the last 14 minutes. The key issue that digital education will bring is unifying the personalization and the massification. I mean, I talked about the huge number of learners, the growing heterogeneity that needs an individual learning product with poor outcomes and exploding costs today. And I told you that the old system won't fix it. 
But what was incomprehensible in the old system, you either had mass education, but it was the same product for everybody, and that didn't do any good. Or you had personalized education, and it was too expensive to scale up. And what digital education will do, it's taking those two directions you can take, and it's pointing them in the same direction. It's unifying the aspect of mass education and individualized or personalized learning. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.